Our scripture reading today is from Luke 1, uh, verses 39 to 56. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on my humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in the remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Claire. Good morning, everyone. Claire told me this last week that she was in a class that uh, had her memorize uh, that scripture back in the day. So I was wondering, Claire, if you're going to you know, just do it for memory today. Uh, well, it's good to be with you all this morning on this second uh, Sunday in Advent. Um, we've, we've mentioned that it's Advent, this season in the church, that we celebrate and remember the coming of Christ. And there is just something about the, the sights and the sounds and the smells of Christmas that uh, just bring a familiarity to us, a comfort. I know this last week we began kind of playing the nonstop Christmas music in the church office and then in our home. And uh, it's just been a lot of fun singing the, these Christmas hymns together as well. I think I maybe have mentioned this before in, in other uh, contexts, but a few years ago, Laura and I found a, a, a used acoustic piano that was free on Facebook Marketplace, and so we, we decided to pay for it to be hoisted up to our third floor apartment, um, and really, Laura doesn't really play the, the piano very well. I, I took lessons my entire uh, childhood, but the best I can play these days is really the beginner level uh, Christmas music. And so this is the time of year that my family and my neighbors really have to put up with me trying to plunk around on the piano. And about every maybe fourth or fifth note, it's just, you know, sounds terrible when I play. Um, and it just is, it, they clash together and it just isn't really a joyful noise uh, to be listening to. Uh, the musical term though for when notes don't uh, really go together, when they clash, it's called dissonance. I think that's a pretty good word to describe a lot of what we experience around this time of year. Uh, dissonance. There's a, kind of this, this clashing of emotions or feelings where uh, we spoke about how uh, you know, there's so much light in the city right now. We, we hang lights in our homes, and yet it's also, ironically, the darkest couple of months of the year. Uh, we sing about peace on earth, and it seems as if our city is anything but peaceful. It's interesting this year we uh, you know, celebrate Advent and we are speaking about the birth, the life of a child that has come into the world, and yet we're in the midst of one of the worst global pandemics we've ever experienced. There's some dissonance, a feeling that a time of year where we're supposed to be joyful and maybe there's not a whole lot to be joyful about. It might feel strange to be decorating um, right now. It might feel a little strange to be going out to Christmas parties or singing, like I said, joyful Christmas carols when your heart is maybe full of anxiety or anxiousness or just heartache of, of, of weight of grief that you might be experiencing. Today, really what I want to talk to you about is the, the joy of the incarnation. I want to give you permission to be joyful in spite of your circumstances. You see, the arrival of Christ means the arrival of this type of joy that's really indestructible, that transcends our circumstances. Last week, John called the title of his sermon, The Mystery of the Incarnation, and this Sunday, I want to talk to you about the joy of the Incarnation. And I want to tell you that though this time of year, there may not be a whole lot that you can point to, uh, to bring you joy, to reasons for being joyful, I want to show you that the Incarnation allows us to be joyful in spite of our circumstances. It makes possible a, a steady type of joy. 
Before we get, though, too far into it, I want to ask the Lord for his help. So would you join with me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Gracious Father, uh, Father, we come with you, come to you this morning uh, with mixed emotions. Uh, we come, Lord, with the, the busyness and anxiousness that we feel. And yet, Father, we also acknowledge the, the joy that we have at the coming of your Son, Jesus, the, the inbreaking of this joy, Lord. We pray that this morning you would help us to see it more clearly, that you would help us to, um, Lord, in spite of our circumstances, rejoice. I pray, Father, that... Um, our joy this morning would actually magnify and, and make known your greatness, your goodness and glory. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been in a sermon series this Advent season where we are looking at the birth story through the book of Luke. And we've been looking at, at the story really from the account that, that Luke, who was a physician, and uh, he actually wrote most of the New Testament. He wrote a lot of the New Testament, I should say, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Uh, which together make up a, a large section of the New Testament. And he tells us at the beginning of each of those books that he wrote that he was writing for a guy named Theophilus. And it's most likely the person who funded the project uh, that he mentions this. But the reason I bring this up to us at the beginning is that he makes it very clear at the start of the book of Luke why he's writing. He makes very clear what he hopes for the reader of his book. And so if you have a Bible open in front of you, I hope you'll keep it open, um, and let your eyes scan back up to the beginning of chapter 1. He makes clear what he hopes for his reader in verse 4. He says he has written this orderly account so that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Luke understood that the Christian life wasn't necessarily supposed to be a life of feeling insecure or unstable. Uh, no, he, he knows that the Christian life, there is some certainty to it, some security. There's, there's a type of, of certainty to Christian joy. And he writes so that we might experience that type of certainty. Uh, today, uh, really what I want to talk to you about is that the Christian joy, it's a, a steady type of joy, a joy that transcends our circumstances. And so the way I'll walk through our passage is really by simply showing you three ways that the incarnation makes steady joy possible. So before we, we dive into those things, though, I'll, I'll first begin by saying that there's really two main characters, two women in our passage uh, who exemplify Christian joy. It's Mary and Elizabeth. Elizabeth is older, Mary is younger, but they both are expecting miraculous children. Elizabeth is Mary's aunt, and we know from earlier in the chapter 1 of Luke that she was expecting a child kind of unexpectedly, that she had longed for a child and had not, had been, able, had not been able to have one. And yet the Lord was intervening, and her and her husband were going to have a child, and his name was going to be John, and this would be John the Baptist, the one who would help prepare the way for the coming Messiah. Then last week, we read about how Mary found out that she was also expecting uh, an angel appeared to her, G Gabriel, who came to tell her that she wasn't just going to be, bear a, so a son who would be a forerunner for the Messiah. He would be the son of God, and she would be the mother of uh, the Savior of the world. Mary was told by the angel that uh, this was probably hard to take in, but she was told that, that she could go and find her Aunt Elizabeth and that her pregnancy would be a sign to her that everything that the angel had said was true. And so as we start our passage, we find Mary. She's on the move. She's on her way to go find Elizabeth. And she goes and travels to find her. And when she arrives, something astounding happens. And so I want you to see this for yourself. Verse 39 is where I'll pick up here. Look at what happens. It says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary... The baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. In Luke's account of the birth of Jesus, the, the first two people to be aware of the incarnation besides Mary was Elizabeth and her unborn son, John. It's a strange thing to notice that it's these two who get the privileged knowledge of Christ's arrival. 
And yet in our passage that we just read a, um, a second ago, there's this kind of intentionality, this, this very specific purpose of these two being the ones to be told. The passage begins with the general and moves to the specific. There's this kind of narrowing in uh, of the passage. It first tells us Mary is going out into the hill country, into a town in Judah, and she goes into a particular house where her greeting meets the ears of a particular woman, and her greeting ends up causing the baby in her womb to leap. There's some intentionality and a particularity to these two coming to hear that the Messiah, the Savior, had come. The, I, around this time, it was thought that the center of a person, the soul, wasn't necessarily in their head or their, their chest and their heart, but rather in their gut. And so when we're told that, that Mary's baby, or sorry, Elizabeth's baby in her womb leaped for joy, it was an erupting type of joy in her soul that happens. Elizabeth and her unborn child, they kind of represent two ends of the spectrum of life. These two kind of were on the, easily to say that they were, they were on the margins of society. One, John the Baptist, he hadn't even seen the light of day yet. In that society, and a lot of times in our society too, unborn children aren't given much respect or given much attention. And yet Elizabeth is on the other end of the spectrum. She's older in age. She would have been marginalized not only because she, she's old, but she also hadn't had any children yet. And that would have been something suspicious and looked down upon. And so we have two, the first two people besides Mary finding out about the incarnation are people who are on the margins. Here are, are two people who don't have much reason to be joyful, and yet here they are rejoicing. Elizabeth, she makes clear why she has a reason to rejoice. She asks this question in verse 43. She says, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth, she's the first person in the book of, uh, first person other than Gabriel the angel to uh, verbally acknowledge the deity of, of the child in Mary's womb. Did you notice the, what she says here? She says, why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She's acknowledging by using that word Lord very intentionally that this child was God himself. This child is the Lord who is coming into the world. He hasn't just traversed the hill country and entered into this town. Uh, no, he has traversed the distance of heaven to earth to come to greet, to come into our world. And so with Mary's greeting comes this joy, this erupting type of joy in Elizabeth and John the Baptist. Let me put it this way. Christian joy, it doesn't depend on who you are. You can be someone on the margins of power and society. You can be at the beginning of life or at the end of life. It doesn't matter. Christian joy transcends our circumstances. You see, Mary, or Elizabeth and her unborn child, they have this joy that's not rooted in who they are, but it's rooted in who Christ is. It is a joy that, that really can't be touched by life's circumstances. The joy of the incarnation is that God came to us as we were. It's not the other way around, that somehow we became certain people that God now communes with. No, it's not as if we were playing hide and seek with God and we've climbed the mountain and found God hiding behind a rock. No, God has left the mountaintop and come down to the valley to meet us where we are. And so the incarnation makes steady joy possible because it no longer depends on your identity. No longer does your joy have to depend upon uh, a job title. No longer does your joy have to be dependent upon uh, being known, your reputation as being successful or wealthy or healthy. If your joy is somehow rooted in your identity, well, then it's susceptible to the, the waves of life, the ups and downs, and your joy is not going to be a steady joy. But if your joy is somehow placed in God himself, the God who came to us as we were, then you will find a steady joy, a joy that uh, can't be touched by the troubles of life. A year like this last year has left us uh, with an acknowledgement that joy can be fleeting at times. And so at the end of this year, 2021, I think we all probably could come up with a lot of reasons, legitimate reasons, why to have heavy hearts. And yet I want us to have this permission to be joyful because our joy is in Christ who came to us. The first reason the incarnation makes steady joy possible is because it reminds us that Christian joy is not rooted in who we are. It's rooted in who Christ is. But let me move on to a, a second reason the incarnation makes steady joy possible. 
as we move along in our passage, we begin to come across Mary's response to all of these events. She is moved to, to sing a song. She sings the, really a, a psalm, a poem. She constructs to express her joy in the Lord. Mary, in, in magnifying the Lord, the best way that she could magnify the Lord is by exclaiming through a song the joy that she has in him. Luke strategically places four kind of poems or songs throughout the birth narrative. And these, these songs or these, uh, these poems, they're actually meant to slow us down a bit in the story. As events happen in the narrative, it's supposed to be this moment to take a pause and to connect our head and our heart together, to really begin to realize what's really taking place. And Mary, she begins to slow us down and helps us to understand that the response, the right response to the coming of Christ into the world is joy. Look with me at, at how she ex, uh, articulates this. There's actually a progression. Uh, there's, she moves from speaking about how this infects her to then moving towards how this affects the whole world. And so let's look at the first half, starting in verse 46. It says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Our culture has at times caused us or taught us to be a little bit skeptical of signs of emotion, of kind of exuberance. Uh, we become a little leery of things that seem maybe a little too expressive. Mary's joy erupts into song, but if anyone dismisses Mary as really just singing a song in a moment of over-the-top emotions would be gravely mistaken. If you dismiss Mary as just being naive and easily moved by her emotions, you would be making completely wrong assumptions about her. The reason we know this is that her song that she sings here is rich in theological conclusions. So she, it's rich with connections to the Old Testament. The song that erupts from her joy is a song that echoes the language of uh, King David in the Psalms uh, to Hannah, who sang sing a song in response to her child being born. All of these great images are rooted in scripture. She was a diligent student of God's word. And so here is a song that we have much to learn from. As I said a second ago, it has many echoes and, and parallels to other songs and psalms in the Old Testament. And the way that Mary starts is echoing the way that Hannah, who birthed Samuel back in 1 Samuel chapter 2, she also sang this song at the miraculous birth of her son. And and, and so she begins with these lines that echo what she said. But look back, it says, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. In Hebrew poetry, we have maybe have mentioned this before in other times and in other places, but Hebrew poetry doesn't necessarily mean that the words rhyme, but the images rhyme. And so these two parallel lines begin by saying, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. She's very, very intentional with her words here. She uses a very unique word. She says, the Lord is my Savior. God is my Savior. This is the first time in the book of Luke that, that God is referred to as Savior, as the one who is coming into the world to bring about her salvation, it provides a way of escape. This last year has humbled a lot of us. It's caused a humbling effect on, on a lot of us. It, as I've said before, there's not a whole lot of reasons we all can point to to be joyful. There's been a lot of studies that have shown this to be true, that one uh, study I came across was done by Boston University, and they're studying the effects of, of or symptoms of depression amongst people before and during the pandemic. And they say that participants in the study who reported experiencing symptoms of depression more than tripled during the pandemic. The study really just reinforces something that we all know to be true, and that's that our circumstances play a huge part in our mental and our emotional well-being. Mary's circumstances, at first glance, don't seem to give us, any, give us any clear reasons why she should be rejoicing. She's been told that she is expecting a child. She's unmarried. She's a young woman. And in her society, she, that would, she already would have been marginalized. But the announcement of her having a child out of wedlock would have meant she's even going to be more marginalized. And yet here she is rejoicing with a joy that is unrivaled, couldn't be touched by any, uh, the richest of kings. 
Mary even uses a word to describe her circumstances. She says that, she, uh, that the Lord has looked upon her humble estate. That word humble estate, it, it, it's not really just talking about her character. It's, it's more of a socioeconomic term, that she is lowly, that she is, her circumstances were one of destitution. She is, she is at the lowest uh, status in her society. And the Lord has seen her in her destitution, and he has come to bring a way of salvation. It's the lowly who find the greatest joys, but not because they've somehow picked themselves up, lifted themselves up out of their circumstances. No, Mary's joy is in the fact that God has come and met us in our circumstances. The word humble used in verse 48 is the same word that Jesus would use later on to describe himself as gentle and lowly, as being humble, as as someone who has come down to those who are at the bottom of the barrel, those who are in destitution. It is a reminder that Christ, that, that in Christ, his arrival comes a joy that doesn't depend on us somehow accomplishing something or doing something in order to earn joy. No, it's actually all based on what Christ has done for us, his coming to, into the world, a joy that no longer is dependent on our identity, as I said, but also it's not a joy that's dependent on what we've accomplished. Mary says in this part of the psalm uh, that the Lord has done great things for her, a joy that is rooted in what God has done is a joy that is a joy that isn't susceptible to our circumstances changing. It's a joy that actually allows us to invite others into. I, I want to make this point uh, as well that that Mary chooses to magnify the Lord, to make known His glory by rejoicing in Him. Let me say it this way: uh, that that she is trying to make known God's greatness in the world, and the way that she chooses to make God's greatness known in the world is by rejoicing in him. The writer and pastor, John Piper, has said it this way, God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. Mary glorifies God or makes his glory known by expressing her satisfaction, her joy in him. The best way to magnify and glorify God is by being content and joyful in him. Can you imagine what our city would see when they look at us, a church that may not have a lot of reasons to be rejoicing, who seems to be meeting in the basement of a basement to worship on Sunday mornings, yet we have a joy that can't be touched by our circumstances. Andrea shared a little bit ago that that our city, it seems to be dark right now, and we can't fight darkness with darkness, but rather we have a joy as a congregation that hopefully will point people to the goodness of our God, the glory of God. The incarnation, it gives us reasons to be joyful in spite of our circumstances. First, because it means that it doesn't depend on who we are. And secondly, it doesn't depend on what we've accomplished. Rather, our joy is in who God is and what he's accomplished. But I want to give you one final third reason why the incarnation makes steady joy possible. I came across a funny cartoon this last week that uh, was of a couple of, a picture of the wise men coming to Jesus, and they're offering their gifts to him. And as they're offering the gifts, the cartoon has the wise men saying, now Jesus, these gifts, they're for your birthday and for Christmas. It's this idea that that this is the time of year that we we give gifts. And I don't know about you, but there can be some anxiousness around trying to get gifts for everybody and the busyness of of trying to make sure we purchase stuff in time. And now with, you know, all of these shipping delays, we're anxious about getting gifts on time. But really the the simple joy of being able to give and receive gifts, it's all just it's a response to the fact that God has given us the greatest of gifts. Whether we acknowledge it or not, uh, gift giving is, is really in response to God giving us a gift, his son. It's interesting that Mary, in her song, her song that she sings here, doesn't really exactly uh, directly mention the gift of this child in her womb, but she does connect this event, her pregnancy, uh, to the mighty acts of God throughout Scripture. What she does in this psalm is that she, she's looking back at all of the great things God has done in the Old Testament, and she's beginning to give thanks, saying that the things that she's experiencing now, her pregnancy, is just one more thing that the Lord has done uh, in history. Her language here, again, mirrors and echoes the language of the psalmist. So look back at verse 51. This is the second half of her song. It says, He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in their thoughts of their hearts. And he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the the rich he has sent away empty. 
He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Milestones, uh, like a birth or like coming up on an end of the year, it, it gives us time to reflect and look backwards. And Mary, at the birth of her son, begins to look backwards, but not just at her own life, but looking far back into the history of her people, the history of Israel. And she begins to connect the dots that, that here the Lord has done something incredible for her in line with the incredible acts of the Old Testament. I don't know if you've noticed, but the ver- verbs in the passage we just read are all in the past tense. She's reflecting on how God has brought down the proud and exalted the humble. It makes us think of, of God bringing down Pharaoh and, and setting free the Israelites. Or maybe it, it brings to mind King David being lifted up while King Saul was brought low. Or maybe it was Daniel who was in exile being preserved while King Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind. God has an, throughout Scripture shown that he lifts up the humble and brings down the, pr- the, the proud. Mary sees herself as just another one in line with all of, all of these great uh, heroes of the Old Testament, the, the, these people who God has worked through in mighty ways. But there's another way that we could understand all of these past tense verbs in the song. It might also indicate that with the incarnation came the absolute assurance of things to come. The absolute assurance that, that this child in her womb would bring about the fulfillment of all of the promises of the Old Testament. You see, it's Jesus, the the baby in Mary's womb, who would turn the world upside down. It would be the one who would bring down the great and mighty kings, and yet this baby, this infant, would be the one who is ruler of all. Mary speaks uh, in a way that that's almost prophetic, that her joy is a prophetic joy that connects the mighty works of God in the past to the mighty works of the conquering king who was but a baby in her womb. Mary, she concludes her song with making this connection between the fulfillment of the covenant promises of God in the Old Testament with the arrival of her son. She says that God has, has helped his servant Israel. And if you're following along and, and, and tracing kind of some repeated words in the passage, you'll realize that the word servant, this is the second time it's referenced. Earlier in her song, she refers to herself as a servant of God. And now she's moved not just from that, the fact that this is good news for her, But this is good news for all of Israel and ultimately the whole world. Mary is beginning to to show us that the gift of her son means this: the world now has a savior. I hope that you get some great gifts this Christmas. I hope you get stuff that you've been longing for. I, I hope you get maybe a gift that you didn't expect to get. I hope that with that joy that you experience this Christmas, it would just be a reminder of the greater gift of our savior who came into the world. But unlike gifts uh, that we receive, that kind of joy comes and it will dissipate after a while, the joy of the incarnation, it's a joy that it actually only grows and expands and increases. There's a, a progression, I said, to this song. It starts with Mary and just moves outward to, uh, to the Israel and ultimately to the whole world. And there's this progression of never-ending joy that is always expanding. It's a better type of joy. And so today, uh, what I'm trying to show you is that the incarnation, it, it sets us free from a joy that is dependent upon who we are or what we've accomplished, and thirdly, what we have, the possessions. No longer is our joy contingent upon possessions because in Christ, we've received everything we could ever need. And so we as Christians can have a joy in spite of our circumstances. This is good news. It's exciting news, but I'll also say that it's a bit of a challenging news to hear. Some of you know that this last week, um, my wife Laura was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And it's been a bit of a roller coaster. If you're aware of diabetes, it means your uh, blood glucose levels are just all over the place. And she was just fitted for a monitor this week that we've been able to track every five minutes what her glucose number is. And over the course of this last week, man, when her numbers have gone up, so is my anxiety. When her numbers were dropping, so did my disposition. My headspace was completely tied uh, to these numbers. It can be easy to allow our circumstances to really pull us like a roller coaster, ups and downs. It was a challenge. It's been a challenge this week. Thinking about the fact that God promises joy, but he doesn't promise that we won't experience problems. God promises joy, but he doesn't promise that we won't face health concerns. God promises joy, but he doesn't promise that we won't fail in life at times. God promises joy, but he doesn't promise that you will never experience needs. 
God promises joy in the midst of your circumstances. It means that no matter what you're experiencing, who you are, what you have, what you've done, the incarnation is the good news that Christ finds you where you're at. He meets us when we are lowly. So today, I, I want to just finish with two challenges for you. I want to, I want to challenge you, for those of you who have, um, the first challenge is for those of you who maybe have never considered uh, whether the incarnation could bring joy to your life. It, it's really a question about whether you rely on your life circumstances for joy or do you find joy in the Lord. The, the implications of the incarnation mean that there's a better joy that has entered into the world, a joy for, that is broken in from the outside and, and now means that our joy is no longer contingent upon anything of this world, but it's a joy that is dependent upon who he is and what he has done and what he has given us. If you want a steady joy in your life, I, I challenge you to stop looking for it in yourself and begin looking for it in God himself. A second challenge a challenge to all of us to simply be genuinely joyful this Christmas. As we come to the end of a hard year, another hard year, it may not feel like there's a whole lot of reasons to be joyful. And yet, what the incarnation tells us is that we can have joy still. We have permission to rejoice. Yes, it's not a reason to, to neglect or to ignore the things that are, cause our hearts to lament and be heartache, but it means that in the midst of our lament, there is a joy that persists. And our joy, our steady joy, might it, like Mary's joy, magnify the goodness and glory of God in our world? Might your joy this Christmas be a joy that helps others see God's goodness, his glory? I hope this Christmas that you experience joy, and I hope it's a joy that, that doesn't just stick around for this Christmas holiday, but it's a joy that continues into the new year. Though the February blues may come, may your joy persist as you go into this next year. Would you pray with me? Our gracious and loving Father, we acknowledge, Lord, that we are sometimes susceptible to the, the waves of life that cause us to rise and fall. But Father, I pray that as, as we, the church, Lord, per, continue to persevere, that, Lord, there would be a joy that is persistent, a joy that is made possible because you have come into this world. I pray, Father, for each one of us this Christmas season uh, that joy would mark the way that we speak to others, the way that we interact. The, Father, would you help us to rejoice by giving gifts without expectation of anything in return. May we invite others around our table to rejoice over a meal together. Uh, might we sing joy to the world. May we sing songs that proclaim your goodness. And Father, may we do it with a hope, with an expectation that with the coming of Christ entered a persistent and steady joy, and with the second coming will come a joy that is never-ending. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.